All right, welcome to the Focus Podcast number 37. We got Josh Pichet. Welcome. Thank you. Well, finally here. And yeah, man. We're doing it. We're doing it, <laughs> <Yeah>. finally. <laughs> After that long summer, we fought, yeah. our schedules finally lined up. Exactly, we we had a, a, a day to Godrich to to go to, and then it was like, no, I gotta I gotta fulfill another obligation. Godrich is such a cool town. Isn't I it? feel like it's this hidden secret in Ontario. Um, the first time I walked in there, it's it's almost got like a movie set. Hill Valley from Back to the Future. You just nailed it. I was gonna you say. know the center courthouse and yeah. everything's really clean and tidy and mm-hmm. everyone's really happy and friendly and and uh, it, it's so lovely. It's off putting. It's yeah. it's just like there's no way that a place can be this perfect, you know. <laughs> but it, it is. Was, that's the feeling I got. It was literally like I had you. Were, somebody was gonna come up to you and say, "Save the clock tower." Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it was exactly like that. And well, once you you know you start talking to a few people there you understand why it's like that because it's like there's so much industry and so much money yeah. out there yeah the uh, salt mine yeah lots yeah. of oh, hold on i just want to see if we're good on this camera all right doing the show by myself folks <laughs> we're doing it live doing it live <laughs> anyways uh yeah let's talk about some things uh you know uh you and I met, I think it was Painted Lady. That sounds about those, right, man. Yeah, that sounds about right. That's one a those, hub. One of those venues. Yeah. Um, but you had something interesting going on during the lockdown, and it was called Canopy. That's right, I did. Yeah. You want to shed some light on that a little? Or? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was a musician before the pandemic, and it was, you know, f- for me and for so many friends of mine, it was the only thing I really knew. Yeah. You know, um, it's been my, like, one non-job for 10 years Mm -hmm. you know um and um i've got my you know i've got friends that are musicians into their 60s and 70s and they're like man i've been doing this since i was 16 you know pandemic hit what am i supposed to do you know (laughs) exactly and um for that first summer in 2020 you know the weather started getting nice and i was just missing music so much and i i realized that you know not only was it an occupation for me but it was something that as an audience member i missed um it was something i used to indulge in mm-hmm. before the pandemic and i was i just didn't feel like myself so um i called my friend terry jenkins who is a fantastically talented audiovisual guy great musician and maybe the best ears in toronto i said man I got this big yard. What if we just brought all the toys out? You know, we pick a day when it's not going to rain and, and we just have a show. And, and he's like, I'm in man. So, you know, we got our Yorkville speakers out and, uh, set up the stands and we had a laptop on a cooler trying to like live stream it, you know, it's very Canadian setup. Yeah, yeah, man. A Coleman cooler. A good. Yeah. Yeah. Green. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. And um, and it was so scary back then. Milk crates, man. Oh it's yeah, how, exactly. It's how we you roll. Get it. Yeah, you it's get how it. we roll. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, in those days, we had so little information that it was it was really uh, it felt like it took a little courage. Mm-hmm. Um, when we asked people if they wanted to come over, there were so many questions. Yeah. Because people missed music, but were so scared. Um, but we, you know, were distance outdoors. Uh, for the first couple of shows, we were just like all masked up the whole time just because, you know, we knew music was such an easy target. Yeah. Uh, it was one of the first things to go away. Instantly. I, re- I remember March 2020, just like everybody was talking to each other. Are, you, are your gigs getting canceled? Yeah, mine are getting canceled, you know. Um, and at first it was just the big shows, but I remember that last St. Patty's. So fast. Everyone's washing their hands and, and you realize how how ineffective we were protected that weekend you know but uh everybody just trying to push forward and then all the gigs disappeared um so that first show back was a really big deal you know we'd gone a couple months without music what was the first day of the first it was lucas stag nice yeah and you can still see the video online this this beautiful moment he played um don't let us get sick 
mm-hmm. Warren Zevon. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were so lucky to capture it on video. And it, it just perfected the moment of what everybody was feeling in that moment. We don't yeah. want to get sick, but we also can't live without music. So that first show, you know, as simple as it was and a handful of people, it, it meant so much to everybody. They were like, we need to do this again. So everybody was available. You know, there's plenty of musicians to choose from. Mm-hmm. And uh, we set up a lineup and set up an email account. And before long, we had people like, hey, I want to take it to this. Mm-hmm. How do I be a part of this? Mm-hmm. I, want, I want to see what's going on. We did that for two seasons. Second season production was really stepping up because we took the winter to sort of get ready. Mm-hmm. So 2021, you know, we had this beautiful elm tree covering the space lit up like Avatar. Oh, awesome. And, um, you know, we were selling out shows. We would have isolated groups of people, but because the yard is so big, you know, we're talking 30, 40 people. We had really sorted the live stream by then. We hardwired the yard for speak on cable fiber optic for the uh, internet yeah um, we had a lighting rig that went up into the tree oh perfect you get ready for everything <laughs> <laughs> and then we also had like uh, ipad controlled yeah, lighting yeah. around the stage um, we put in a lot of effort to really hide the the audio system because the space was really uh, nature focused you know we had shows where raccoons crawled into the show yeah uh, we had one show where a possum went through you know like yeah it was like the the yard the nature was even welcoming and accepting of the music That's so awesome. so with each show we solved more problems um we got better more efficient the acts got better the neighborhood my goodness the st Clair west neighborhood in toronto it wouldn't have been possible without that group of people many of which i still haven't met yet mm-hmm. um, but we really tried to get the word out to the to the community and say hey if you can hear us from a distance we hope you're listening um and you know you'd finish a song and you'd hear the entire neighborhood oh that's awesome start to cheer you yeah. could hear people in the distance and go okay this is really cool i appreciate it too so we wrapped up our our 2021 season and uh, November rolls around and we find out that we've been named Toronto's best live music venue by Now Magazine. And uh, uh, second place was the Horseshoe Tavern, which for any, anyone not from Toronto, you know, the Horseshoe Tavern's been there for 75 years. I love the Horseshoe Tavern. But it was just this weird time mm-hmm. in the city's history when a yard can become a significant place for, for art to happen. Yeah. Um, and that in itself being such a powerful lesson that music can exist outside of the concert hall. Mm-hmm. Um, and what is a concert hall but a place where a performer and an audience can peacefully meet. So, uh, so with all that, those lessons and all that practical knowledge, I've been really trying my best to get the word out to the music scene. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and this takes the form of, you know, you write grants and you try and get a hold of the Toronto Music Office and, you know, jobs come available, you apply for them, you know, what's it called? Uh, the, uh, the Massey Hall, you know, uh, program coordinator, I applied for that, you know, really trying to get the word out to people that I think I know some of the things that the Toronto Music scene is missing. Mm -hmm. And... They've been missing for a while, and then some of the things become more prescient in a recovery mode. We really, as a music scene, have a hand to play. We want to play it as well as we can, because for the upper level music scene, there's a lot of things that are up and running again, but for that garden, that's what I call it, the lower level, where bands grow and where, uh, art is really uh, played with and refined and developed. That's where the music scene is really hurting. And the symptoms are taking many forms, but there's things that we can do. And they're, they're actually really simple things mm-hmm. that we can do to help the Toronto scene come back better than it was. Um, there's a lot of things that aren't worth going back to. You know what I mean? <laughs> hundred percent you know i know exactly what you mean and you know like other than i'll be honest like other than you there wasn't too many people making an attempt at 
to revitalize or take a stand in the the missing live music scene really there wasn't there was maybe maybe one because even it was interesting you said everything's timing right so it's like the Alma Combo has been waiting for a long, long time to, to re-show themselves. And the yeah. timing was bad because they had the, the, the week in little, for uh, reopening. And that was the week everything shut down. Yeah. But on the other hand, they are ready for the future because they had a full live streaming production. That's also true. Yeah. Top of the line. And I know I work with people that help set that infrastructure up. And it's like whatever the future entailed they were ready for it yes. so their timing was bad in a way of you know reintroducing themselves but at the same time they're already light light years ahead of other venues and knowing yeah. where the future is going to go and then like you said i don't want to take anything away from the horseshoe but it was almost like a default because it was there's only a few places that actually had any live thing going and yeah. I was very familiar of like the whole city of who who was doing what, and as far as like streaming, you know, and yeah. um, they only had like a single camera that was kind of you know a locked off shot, but it was still they were still feeding something, so they were they were at least getting into that next stage of viewership, and then yes. Uh, yes. I know that um, what was it? Burdock? They already had an infrastructure that was like that. So they were, oh, right. yep. they were adapting as everything closed and they're like, okay, we're going to make this a private uh, yep. production area now as opposed to a bar. Right. So myself, I saw this coming and kind of, this is my profession as well. And it's like, I see where the live television aspect is going. And also it's like, mm -hmm. like you're talking about, uh, you know, seeing the opportunities of where the music scene is going to go and the gap, especially for the garden people, right? That's yeah. us. So it's like, I had this idea of like live streaming and I pitched it to Painted Lady and they were like, yeah, use the spot. Yeah. And then, so they went to their, uh, their board. They have a board with all of the bars yep. and they just recategorize themselves as a film set. Exactly. So they took me and I had three, I had a, a crew of four people and we just, I had all this equipment I have here. And then I brought in two really good camera operators. That's the thing. I got yeah. guys who do live music. They've done everything, the Junos, all this stuff. So I brought in two good ops and it's these little handy cams. Yeah. And then I have a buddy who's like the, wanting the best, one of the best lighters in the country. So he came and just like tweaked everything, made a great look. And then, yeah. so we started a series there and I actually convinced them to get fiber optics. I was yeah. like, you guys should get fiber for the internet, for the internet to yeah. continue this as things reopen, you guys will be way ahead of everybody else. And this will be then option for touring bands or anything that wants yeah. a package like this. And to be honest, I'll be honest with you. Most of the bars couldn't see this as yeah. a viable thing for a, a viable tool for your venue they almost yeah. saw it as a deterrent as like a competition it's like oh they're gonna watch it from home so nobody's gonna come here right and drink our booze which is yep. our number one income provider and the way I look at it is like no it's something it's something that creates a buzz where you want to be like yes like because uh, I grew up in the era of like uh, electric circus and all the live shit and when you're a kid that's out of town, oh, and electric you're like, circus. I gotta get there. But it was yeah. like it, it was a vibe of like, yeah, having to be there. You FOMO, know? exactly. That fear of missing out. Exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. Nice acronym. But it's it's true, and I lo I love the way you said it about like, um, you know, experimenting, and it just there wasn't many venues that were really keen on like giving you that realm of experimentation, but yeah you having the back the backyard that's a perfect opportunity and you guys just ran with it which is was so cool and i saw yeah. the outcome and i saw like like you said you know people were fiending for live music and they just came out to support and it's yep. just like in any way possible if they could just sit there and listen or if they could be a part of it in some capacity they wanted to so badly yeah it's uh and now 
also like I was, I'm trying to follow up on what you said about because I seen this too. I was I was red hot doing shows right up until the end. Mm-hmm. I had friends in in the states that we had collaborated. We we're gonna meet in Ottawa, and then yep. from there we had plans to go to Europe. All this shit. We were gonna like they were gonna be my go in the states, and I was gonna be their go in Canada. So it's like yep. we were perfect together. And we had all these plans and aspirations and I was smoking hot. Like I'd just done a few shows in the States and I was like, now I'm rolling. And yep. then all that came to a screeching halt and it was just like gone instantly. So that's yeah. kudos to you on like, cause a lot of people I know just that was their final straw that just took them out. Like you said, a lot of older musicians, what am I going to do now? So that was just it for them. But to, to, to not only like, shut down completely but to like you know uh, reincarnate yourself to also like get the motivation to do something like that that's a lot so big ups to you to, to hey, that man thanks man and, and it, uh, it was a, a team effort you yeah. know I mentioned my friend uh, Terry Jenkins who uh, was one of the best collaborator, collaborators I ever had it was like we had an entropy towards solutions mm-hmm. um, we could really easily communicate we could we had strong yes and but there was also that like I don't think that's a good idea yeah. okay and then you try another honesty idea. with each other yeah yeah, yeah. yeah really ripping the bandaid off yeah. in those moments and uh, and we could really work towards what was going to work best yeah. um, running a music venue I quickly realized it was fixing a thousand little problems and as soon as you don't want to fix little problems anymore you stop getting better up too yeah Yeah, that too so you know we we'd be having conversations of like you know what color should the back wall be lit as yeah and it was as important a conversation as you know how do we get people in safely uh how do we you know how do we prevent you know a super spreader event you know every little aspect of it was of equal importance yeah um and Talking about, you know, what venues can do better, I realized that, you know, during the pandemic and post-pandemic, now the post-show has become one of the most important aspects of a show. You know, there's certainly always been the time where promotion and preparation and the show itself is, you know, great. But um, as we come out of this really tough pandemic and we're rebuilding the scene, the post show represents an opportunity for uh, content, for FOMO, and for really showing people what is going on in the city. And for that reason, um, I stress so much to venues the importance of how social media gets people to your venue and how those real life interactions get people to your social media. Um, I think that word is so triggering for venue owners. <laughs> well, it means paying somebody. Yeah. I think that's what... Because nobody's got the time. That's what the fear is. Right? Nobody's got the time yeah. for it. So it's like, it's just this ad expense. And if you don't do it right, it won't necessarily result in anything. Yeah. So for some venue owners, they look at it this, as this, like, this thing they have to do. Hey, don't we too? Right? Yeah. Um, but there's a way to approach social media that it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of work. And it doesn't have to be that term, social media, that you yeah. have cognitive dissonance towards as more of a tool. Yeah. Not I, a media, not like something that you think you're wasting your time with, with gossip or anything, but as a tool. Mm-hmm. Is it a marketing tool? Marketing, really. You have to think yeah. of it as re-marketing. And one so, thing I'll say to, uh, to artists especially, but like this is true for venues, Um, Is there anything more artistic than a blank square? That is art. Yeah. Right? And what is social media? It's a blank square. Yeah. So if if you're finding it's not working or you're finding you're not having fun with it, you can mix it up, man. You know, like you can have fun with it. Clean that slate. Yeah. Um, But one thing I will say to venues is every person that comes into your venue is a potential videographer, Mm -hmm. a potential maven meaning like a person that will uh, go around and telling everybody, I had this great night at this venue, seeing this band, you know? So the best thing that you can focus on when you're trying to turn live events into social media is 
make your shows translatable to a phone. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is really the key. Post show, I like when you say post show. Post show. Yeah. So that takes a couple forms. You're probably gonna have to put a, a big focus on lighting. Yeah. You know, um, even if you have great camera, you don't have good lighting. It doesn't Lighting's count for nothing. This is it. Yeah. Lighting's everything. Okay. Um, you're probably going to have to remind people to take video. Mm -hmm. So literally, I tell venue owners, walk around your venue, pick your camera angles. Yeah. Pick where the stage looks great. Yeah. Scout and it put out. a sign there with a camera icon. Good, good or, shot here. Yeah. Yeah. And your social media. That's brilliant. And suddenly, you're going to start getting tagged in videos from that angle. Boom. There you go. Did, and, and did that take work? Well, you had to go make the sign, I guess. But yeah. it's, it's setting up a system, right? Yeah. Here, here's another thing. This, this can fall on musicians and technicians. I got bad news for loud bands. You don't translate well to a cell no. phone. Unfortunately, no. it is a, a, a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, and just my own artistic opinion, I, I always like to draw them clean in. Clean it up. Just draw them in. Up. Don't yeah. blow them away. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Play loud in the loud parts, as my buddy uh, Terry Wilkins will say. Yeah. But, um, I agree. Quiet bands do better on social media. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean you can't rock out, but you do have to find that me medium volume. You know, clarity too. Yeah, and let's be honest, Torontonians they love to talk. If you have the stage, if they for can't it, talk. Yeah, rock it out. Yeah, no, it's true. If you have the stage for it, rock it out. But it, absolutely, I agree. Small but it venues, is a disadvantage. Small venues turn into mud. If yeah, you have just. Yeah, you got to fit the, yeah, the size you're not of the gonna crowd. Bring in two stacks. For, <laughs> I've seen it. I've been in it. I've been in with other acts. Totally. I've been in with other acts in and on, on showcases, and it's like, wow, you didn't need to bring the eighteen wheeler. Yeah. For the, the 30 spot, the 30 person venue. <laughs> so let's say yeah, no, you've got like, your venue and you've lit it well. Yeah. That's a whole topic. That's yeah, a whole topic. That's a whole But other let's say you've, you know, done the deep dive on, on lighting for camera. Uh -huh. um, I'll say this. I'll, I'll say this. Purple yeah. is a magic bullet. Yeah. You have your camera scanning three colors. Red, green, blue. Yeah. And primers. And if you light your stage in blue, you're getting one scan. If you light your stage in, in red, you're getting one scan. Mm -hmm. You light your stage in purple, you get two scans, and there's more dimension to it. Yep. So that's one thing. I, one lighting trick I will give you. Purple's awesome. Yep. But let's say you've lit your stage for the camera. You've got your sign up that says, hey, don't forget to take a video. Don't forget to tag us. Mm -hmm. You know, Maybe there's even a little uh, replaceable spot so you can add the band's tag. Yep. You know, um, People are taking video. And you're getting tagged on social media, right? But people aren't still aren't coming out. It's still not leading to that. Mm -hmm. um, another enormous mistake I see happening is um, the name of the venue is not on stage. Yeah, with a tag. Yeah, that's right in people's faces. Yeah, yeah. That that is you're you're literally getting people to aim. You know, on a good night. Or latch on to the social media site that you want to really take off. Like if you, you want your Instagram yeah. to take off, have the logo, the Instagram logo yeah. with the at wherever you're at. Right. Yeah, 100%. So it's kind of a chain of events that we've designed yep. here. But suddenly your shows are becoming social media events. People are taking video. Mm -hmm. um, then the other side of the coin that you want to look at, and by the way, that all of that is a ton of work. Mm -hmm. You know, so we you know we cover it very quickly, but there's a lot of work that goes into another all of that. job. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, another thing I really like to do, or tell venues to do, musicians are one of the hardest working uh, sectors. Yep, I will argue that to the death. Yep, um, they're hardworking people. So oftentimes you just have to enable them. Yeah. So I say to music venues, where's your camera shelf? Where is the pre-built shelf where a musician can safely put a camera? Mm -hmm. You know, out of view, or out of reach. Out of drinks. You know, out of drinks. <laughs> Somewhere safe. Yeah. Um, musicians will bring their own cameras. They will take video. They will edit it. They will most, do, they'll do all the work. And mostly where nobody's going to stand in front of it. And Yeah, clear line of sight. Yeah. 
Um, that's something you see a lot in comedy clubs. You'll set up without people. Yeah. And then they'll be like, oh, it's a great shot. And then people come and there goes your shot. It's gone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So another situation where you can pre-design, pre-pick your camera angle yep. and enable others to get the word out about your venue. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, there's the other side of the coin. Um, how do we get people to uh, go from media uh, or sorry, how do we get people to connect to us um, from real life to social media? Mm, yeah. And I think QR codes are nothing new, but they're still grossly underutilized. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and also, uh, the, the medium that those usually end up on, posters. Yeah. Um, we're still going to need posters. Postering is always going to be a part of it. It's a new thing, yeah. Totally. But venues are going to make everyone's life easier by getting off the poster train. Yeah. Um, the venues that are incorporating digital uh, uh, advertising signage, in-house, signage and, yeah. that is the way to go. Yeah. You're making everyone's life easier. Yeah. There's not this, let me get the posters to you, uh, go get them printed, an expense, a trip, going around the venue, putting them up. Pay up posters that don't get used. Hey, yeah. It goes on and on. Yeah. yeah. How many times have you done that? Well, you've had posters you take the and there's time. like a hundred. And you and get you them down there left. and the venue hasn't put up your posters. Yeah. And you think, you're like, dude, I spent all that money. Yeah. It took me a couple hours to come down yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So yeah. it's 2024. It should be an email. Yeah. Here's the design. Upload it to your system. Put it in the, in the rotation. Mm -hmm. And put a QR code on everything. Yep. Yeah. Um, if you have people coming into your uh, show, uh, as they are waiting in line, there should be a way to connect with you. Yes. You know, a pull-up sign. Instantly. Yeah. Yeah. Most bands aren't doing that. Ticket right at the ticket spot. You should get. I've like I 100% agree all what you're saying. And uh, to me, because this is the same thing with television. So television is taking this form from live television. The components of the back are not changing. Same with yeah. us. You know what I mean? Yeah. You still need a full band. You still need the same sound text. You need all that. It's just the, the end where people are viewing it is changing. Yeah. So it's like what you, and it's not a lot of this is the thing with podcasts too. It's like radio to podcasts. The structure is not changing. It's yeah. all old format. So the same thing with pro promotion for for venues. You, they used to pay promoters. Yeah. A promoter would just be a promoter, not the bar owner. Not yep. somebody that worked yep. there as a staff person. We're all having to take on more jobs. It's just, it, yeah, it's just, it's Great. Ju it was just a promoter who promoted and basically booked the bands. Yeah. So now you have a, a, an um, opportunity for that person who has that experience to come and, you know, turn it into a new position again, where that person can be the social media person and book the bands as well. Yeah. So that person is a job. And then they know the digital content. They they have a schedule well ahead of time. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, please. And then have a criteria. Have like a standard, you know? Yeah. Like you must have your material in by three weeks for yeah. us to advertise. So there's there's an onus on the, you know, the, the artists. And then there's an onus on the venue to both meet a deadline together to maximize mm -hmm. what you could potentially get. And so there's a whole bunch of things that could be attached to that as well. And just, and it's not like totally cleaning a slate clean. It's just utilizing what's already there and maybe yeah. upgrading with a couple of simple technology things. And, and there's, there's still venues, you know, 2024, there's still venues in this city who are resistant to that or yeah. maybe don't understand, yeah. you know, uh, for a lot, you know, I, it, it's a new thing, you yeah. know, but, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I know of so many venues where like the artists are really reaching out. Hey, here's a collaborate post. All you have to do is accept. And then the promotion is transferred to you and included with you. And, and there's just a lack of collaboration. Yeah. And, and that's I've, not what a scene is. I know I, I couldn't, I'm, it's almost in a frustration terms because it's like, I, I have a standard for myself totally. and I fall behind too. I'm not, you know, I'm trying to do it all by myself. So it's like, I try to get all the content to 
the venue more like two months. Yep. Like, at least two months. So I was like, here's the shit. Here's three versions of the flyer. Here's a video clip. Here's all the stuff I wrote a blurb out for you, everything. Please just use it. And then you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. And like three days before, you're like, are you going to use this? And yep. then the day of, they use it. And then they're like, oh, you didn't bring enough people. It's yep. like, I gave you everything you needed. All you had to do was, and then collaborate yep. on this. And the thing that a lot of old folks don't understand is like, they have a name already. Yeah. Like their venue has a name, a known name, and they have thousands of followers they have like ten thousand followers yeah so it's like you're reaching out to say let's collaborate and yeah. it'll have a reach and, and yeah. if you have a consistent reach it's like the people that maybe aren't aware of your venue will be introduced to your yeah. venue once they get into the scene because you already have the name and the reputation and yeah. i would say there's there's kind of two ways my opinion there's kind of two ways that people decide to go out to see live music so the the first way is people want to hey let's do something tonight yeah what, what's the first thing they do they take out their phone yeah and they want to see what's going on yeah so it is worth asking how many clicks till they find out what's going two on two clicks i've been told for everything yeah two you clicks. don't have many Two clicks for everything. So you go to uh, a venue's, let's say, Instagram page. Yeah. Here's what every venue should have, in my opinion. I call it um, a connectivity post. There's a way for artists to do it, and there's a way for venues to do it. But for a venue, usually what it means is, here's the shows we have going on this week, this month. Um, you want to get to that maximum uh, 25 account tag. Yes. What it, whatever gets you to that, you know. So for some venues that'll be a month schedule. Use for it. some that'll be Use a week. It. Yeah. And um, you want to tag everybody in the picture. You want to tag everybody in the post mm -hmm. for the biggest accounts involved. You want to commit to your four collaborates. Yep. And that not only will track really well on social media, but that will be a resource for people who want to see your venue. It also kicks want to come in, out and see live music. in the, the yeah. AI in the system. You yeah. go to that page and it's the top of the page and go, oh, here's their listings for this week. Oh, Saturday. Yeah. They're, they got this is it at 8 o'clock. So I see a lot of venues that don't have that kind of post. Mm -hmm. uh, for musicians who want to do this type of post, it's kind of the opposite in that here's all the venues I'm going to be playing. Yeah. Um, and again, if that's your year, that's okay. But that kind of, that level of connectivity post is really good for your social media. Yeah. Um, here's the second way that people go out and see live music, and unfortunately, it's getting rare and rare in Toronto. But you see this in uh, classic music cities: New Orleans, Memphis, New York, Nashville, Austin. Um, all of these great music cities where, like, the the city runs on it. Their main export is people come to check out you know the french quarter yeah. you know uh that that's what toronto has dreamt of for so long that's what we used to have a taste of and well when the music scene was going better in toronto we had what they had which was a, a music street yeah maybe even a couple a strip a strip yeah that's the other way that people go out to see music they just go you know what every time we go to this one the randoms one area yeah. Or one club, we have a great time. I don't care who's playing. Yeah. Let's go down there. And what is that? That's reputation. Yeah. And that is something that Toronto is uh, varying on. Yeah. There are so many primed neighborhoods in Toronto that could be this. So I approached, uh, you're familiar with the Junction neighborhood? Yep. I love that neighborhood. Yeah. It used to be its own town. And uh, it's. My mom lives there. She's, oh, she's wonderful. On, she's on Quebec. She's been there for a long time. Very well, you know, if you don't live on Dundas, it's not the junction. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If you're not on the tracks, you're off. I used to live on a net, and they're yeah. like, that's not the junction. No, sorry, bro. And it's yeah, like, uh, it's half a block. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> no, that's not the you're junction. You're not feeling the vibration of the train. You're not. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the junction has more music venues per square block than anywhere else in Toronto. Yeah. Crazy. And I noticed this. So what do I do? I get a hold of their VIA. Yeah. And I talk to Carol. Yeah. Hi, Carol. 
Um, and I say to them, I'm like, you guys could be the Broadway of Toronto. Yeah. And uh, what is needed? Reputation. You need to build your reputation that every time people come to the junction, they're going to have a great time. Yeah. Um, so that's a tough thing to build. Uh, every music venue wants reputation. You know what men- music venue has reputation in Toronto? Tapestry. Yeah. You've been there? Yeah. Um, for those not in the know, used to be a, a, another music venue, a Poetry Jazz Cafe, yep. uh, which moved and is still an awesome music venue. You should go check them out. I love uh, poetry. Uh, but Tapestry was taken by the Raffi brothers. Uh, Sean Raffi is a good buddy of mine. I saw him on Sunday. Uh, very talented musician, DJ, and understands the detail that's needed for a good night of music. Mm-hmm. So he does this event. Uh, he used to do it in Tapestry. It's, it's too big now. They can't do it in their music venue. And it's called Four Play. And they get four musicians, and they don't know who they're going to be playing with. Mm. They set up at different times. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, everybody buys a ticket, $20 cover. Um, you come in, everybody's buying drinks. They stand around the stage. It's a circular format. Yeah. And when it's time to start, the musicians just like come out of the crowd. That's awesome. And you go, oh, that's who's playing. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. 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 And, um, it obviously attracts a lot of musicians. So it's not, you can't really figure out who it is and everybody's won't say. Yeah, yeah. You know, people who aren't playing are playing along. It's part They're of like, the fun. Oh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say it. It's part fun. of the fun. Yeah, it's yeah. part of the fun. They each get a chance to start a, an improvised song. Yeah. Um, and they go on and the solo and there's collaboration. And, and then at the end, uh, they play a fifth song. It's a dance party. Oh, sick. Right. So it's just, you end up fulfilled at yeah. the end of the night. Your heart is full. Yeah. Now, think about this. There's a lineup down the street. Everybody is happily paying a $20 cover. Yeah. And happily buying $14 cocktails that are fantastically made. Yep. Nobody knows who's playing. It's just all about the buzz and the reputation. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's the reputation of the venue and Shant himself yeah. and the Raffi brothers. Yeah. Um, and they've They've earned that. Those guys opened their first club, the Oud and the Fuzz, in uh, 2020. Damn. And stuck it out. Wow. And have built everything that they're enjoying right now. Yeah. So let's say you're a music venue. You want to build that Raffi brother reputation. Mm -hmm. Um, Here's what I think is, here's what I think you should do. Here's what I suggested to the junction. Um, Focus on your weekdays. Yes, fill out those weekdays. Yeah. If you have a modest showing on a Friday, Saturday night, which hopefully you do, um, a lot of venues, you know, do. Let's say even you're only at 60% capacity. You actually don't have that much to gain by maxing out the capacity. Yeah. It would be much better to go your Monday, Tuesday, where you're at 10% capacity. Yeah. And fill those nights draw try and draw people yeah. for those nights yeah so to a lot of music venues that makes sense yep also you're going to be able to attract a higher level of talent on a monday night we're all open mic and yeah everybody's out on the prowl because here's the thing about toronto there's tons of work that satisfies the corporate interest mm-hmm. so whether it's playing a corporate event or a conference, yeah. or even just the weddings of the wealthy. Yep. Some of the greatest players of our generation are spending their entire career making very good money playing weddings. Covers, usually. Covers? Yeah. You know, rocking that uptown funk. Yep. Good. Good yep. for you, man. Good I'm not you. saying there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. But when it comes to booking a club, hey, man, I'm busy. Yeah. So those guys and ladies... Sorry. <laughs> Those players yeah. are much more available on a Monday. Yeah, exactly. So you can achieve that higher level. You have more to gain. Mm-hmm. Um, you can attract musicians as well. Mm-hmm. And you can show people what they're missing on a night when 
when you might not normally have that much to gain. You know? Well, and also like a, a world of people that work the entertainment hours. Yeah. The people that work, the, the they're working every Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah. And so now they have a time, their night off. Yeah. And they're coming out and enjoying other higher levels of music. And, yep. And collaborating. And yeah, no, I agree. And uh, also on that, I, uh, it's, it's, it's the reputation. And then it's also kind of like, you know, a new way for uh, venues to kind of like expand on what they already have. Yeah. Like some places, like yes. it's easy to, you know, everybody goes out on Friday, Saturdays. Yeah. So it's like, you, you're not really putting much work into it. Like if you're in a venue in an area that's already kind of busy. Yeah. You're not really uh, in need of trying to work hard. Right. So now it's like, here's an opportunity to really go ahead of the other venues. If you really want to like, you know, be different and unique. Exactly. It's like, take yeah. that approach with, you know, opening up to uh, other nights and stuff yeah. like that. And, uh, you know, you see places that are really trying hard to, to survive that and survive yeah. that transition. And, uh, I've been fortunate enough to, to been given places where it's like, Oh, you can have a residency here tonight. And to me, that's more like something that we could all have together. So mm -hmm. like I had, uh, the TO lounge there in Parkdale on the Sundays he gave me, but it was working great when I was in the neighborhood. Yeah. So I would give it to somebody for the night and like, do what you like with it. It's your night. Yeah. If you want to charge door or if you want to throw the jug around or if you just want to jam to you like you make the decision and then yeah. when they weren't using it it's like i'll use it for my expansion yeah trying out my band and stuff like that and then i'm not i moved back to this side so i i pass it on to somebody else but it's like so much for so long has just been on the musician to do everything and it's like yeah now coming up with these ideas for the venues and it's like it's if the venues don't invest in stuff like this, they're all going to fall one by one and not do music because it's, they're not going to draw more people in and their, their other nights are going to be dead. Um, so I will kind of want to expand on this question, but, and then we can move on to like yeah. another subject. Um, you played in the States a, a bit too. And I, just as the pandemic hit, I played a few places in the States and I finally played in the States again for the first time since the lockdown. Yeah. And the difference between venues in Canada and the States are like drastic worlds apart. Yeah. Completely worlds apart. And it's like the things that we're talking about for Canadian venues to do American venues have been doing for years some of them like a hundred years without even know? asking yeah and it's like i the, here's one simple difference you know what i mean and it's like god forbid you get a drink at some bars and i'm i'm not the one to say like i deserve all this stuff but it's like you bring your talent yeah. and all your shit and all your gear and you don't even get a free beer it's like <laughs> that's very common in canadian venues so i'm in this i went to this one in new hampshire and it was great, great green room, all this stuff. They had a fridge fully stocked with beer. Yeah. Take as much as you want. Yeah. Obviously, don't hoard it and walk out with it. But it's just like they're not even thinking of like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, of course not. Yeah. Uh, like, me no, neither. I'm just a Canadian traveler. That's all. <laughs> but it's the respect there, where it's like I'm not going to treat you like a customer when you're coming in, like as a musician coming in. You're not just another customer buying right. a drink and food. Well, I'm going to treat you like the talent that you are. Yeah. And it's like you're coming in, whatever you need, it's on the house to make you comfortable. Yeah. And give, you're giving all of your talent to us. Yeah. Basically paying, still, you know, underpaid. <laughs> and it's like, but at least there's that gesture of like, right. let's, I'll, let me take care of a few drinks for you. Because I know that's twenty dollars out of your gas money, yeah. or you're like, you know, and just like, because I had no money for a place to stay there, so basically I stayed up 
for more than 24 hours that I hung around the venue and it was like Dude. It was cool. They and the professionalism Sleep of them. In the car. Being, but no, but the, the, this is the difference between a, a, a U.S. venue too. Is like the professionalism of the sound guy actually showing up on time yeah. and like giving you that time to relax at the venue. So I got there early. The sound guy was already there. I yeah. did my sound check, and now I have two hours to relax in the venue without worrying. Yeah, the sound guy showing up or not. In anyways, it's a whole different world different culture different culture of it and a different consumer consumer yeah consumption appreciation because americans really consume music yes they do as like this is my hobby i i like this i go out and pay for this and like when i'm coming out i'm coming out with a 100 bucks and i'm dropping it all on the band and booze yeah. and there's a lot of factors that difference between Canadian and American venues, but it's the mentality right away coming out with the viewer or knowing that they're coming out spending money and they're seeing a professional yeah. that they're going to enjoy. I mean, you touch on a couple uh, important things that, like, uh, I th I think that I want to talk about, and the conversation with, you know, the music industry's connection to alcohol. Mm is fit slowly changing it's layered rapidly changing it, it's it's a driving force yeah how many shows are funded by alcohol yeah um and then it's the profit margin mm -hmm. what you know a lot of the differences we witness in the music industries are because of the ways that alcohol is distributed and costs know, and costs um, I think if you're a music venue in 2024 and you plan on paying the bills with just that revenue stream, alcohol, you're in a rough you're, road. You're not very diversified. No, maybe maybe you are doing great. Yeah, um, but, but there's very very few places that are just rocking it off alcohol. Yeah, no. I, when I go see music, I I feel I want to be the change that I want to see in the scene. Yeah, so. Uh, I have 20 bucks with me to put in the jug mm -hmm. and then I have 20 bucks with me uh, you know to buy my refreshments and support the venue yep you know um, and I'll go to a venue intending to spend money and sometimes I'm unable to yeah you know I personally I haven't drunk alcohol in a while so I'm looking for a non-alcoholic option yeah and some venues have really dug their heels in there now nah, we sell beer okay yeah. great yeah but I won't be buying anything yeah um, the uh, you can certainly talk about like health and safety too with alcohol. Oh yeah, Absolutely. I always say musicians never get a health and safety day. No, and there are a lot of hazards that go along with their job. Oh yeah, um, people approaching the stage, and I've had quite a few. Totally <laughs> getting on the stage. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, on the topic of <clears throat> you know hospitality and good gestures with venues. It is, it, it is in a venue's best interest to attract people that like the venue, you know, performers. Mm -hmm. You want it to be a fun gig because then the band's going to have fun and yep. then your customers are going to have fun. Yeah. And that's a connection that sometimes gets lost. Yeah. Um, you want the gig to be very easy, as easy as possible, mm -hmm. so that the venue, uh, you know, can prep for a show easily and everybody's in a good mood by the time you're done and ready your performers comfortable your performers comfortable so you know that can so often mean backline that's a big difference between american venues and canadian venues oh now everybody wants you to pay for backline yeah yeah totally. oh well backline and, and a sound person where totally. here's the other thing you've mentioned too because you know enough sound people too and i know the costs of everything yeah so now when you're trying to hide three hundred dollars to i want to know what is that going to go towards yeah is that actually going towards the sound guy but are is he on salary like do you actually that have too. him as an employee or is like is he only getting paid through the band every gig right so you're already like putting the onus on me to pay him but it's also a low rate yeah so it's like i the money has to come out of me and i'm employing your sound operator right so and i personally believe like if if you want to be the level of venue 
yeah. that has their own salary. You should guy. have a on that's a guy great. on salary, but or uh, as an employee, the, it would be in the best interest to try and get rid of as many expenses to anybody involved, yeah, as possible. Yeah. So you know, for most venues, I say, look, if you want to do this on the cheap, have a house drum kit. Yep. Have a house bass amp. Have a house PA system. You could get a guitar amp. Most guitar players will bring you don't their need own. To. Most yeah. guitar players yeah. are like, I like mine. Yeah, exactly. Uh, house piano. Yeah. Is great to have. Yep. And um, and if you're if you can't afford a sound guy, don't expect anyone else to afford it. Put the board beside the stage. I guess you're not one of those venues. I hate to break it to you, but um, put the board beside the stage, and uh, th that's going to be how you start off. Because most of us can do it, and that's the thing. That's what I learned after years of you know doing music on this on the road. Is like if you bring somebody with you, that is equal to you know what I mean. Yeah. Every each like I go with keys a lot, and we have at least a two hour catalog each of us. Yeah. So that's we can cover a full night, and we know how to do s basic sound. So it's like you travel with somebody who can do sound with you. Yeah. So you got a sound guy with you. So if you're yeah. traveling on the road, he knows the show, you, and you're like, I won't say the venue, but there's a place in Montreal. They're insistent on having two hundred dollar fee, and I said, Well, I mm -hmm. can, I, and I also know sound people in Montreal that will come and glad, like help out and do the sound yep. check, and it's like. I can do this. I don't. Can I just waive that fee? Yeah. And then so once they say no, now I know it's just like a hidden cost that they're pocketing. There's a great venue here in Toronto, the Alpine. Yeah. And they've got an awesome system where the board is movable. Yeah. So when the band has a budget, you can get the There's board out option. center room. There's an option. And you can plug it in. I like that. It runs the same system. Yep. And then when there's not a budget. The board gets moved next to the stage. I'm all for like fees. Here's the thing. I'm for, uh, you know, some places charge a certain, like they'll take a 10%, whatever. Yeah. I'm all for that. If you're going to provide me with a service. Yeah. Like I did one in Edmonton and it's on White Ave, which is, you know, the, the best strip to be on. But I, I'm not familiar with the venue, but they, sometimes I'm, happy that they have their own door person and mm -hmm. sometimes I'm a little sketch because I, I want my own person doing my yep. own count yeah, are totally. you skimming for me right so it's like they provided the sound person they provided the, the door person yeah, and they did quite a bit of advertising and also they were cool I gave them my, uh, my um, content well ahead of time so they were good like that so they took uh hundred bucks and then they took 10% off the door, which I didn't mind because it's like they did. And they had a real aggressive door person who was like, you know, you know, the person who are app, they're all the apprehensive at the door and he's like, get in here. So he was better yeah. with his personality to get people yeah. in more that were kind of on the fence. So that's worth yeah. paying that fee to that guy. Yeah. Sets the tone for the night. Exactly. Cause he yeah. knows the spot and he's like, comfortable with that so I'm cool with that where there's other places where I won't say in Toronto but it was a bigger venue we yeah. had a great night we yeah. killed it and they were insistent that they use their door person and all of us at the end of the night were like I counted like 175 people and then they're giving us ticket money for a hundred yeah so it's like where's the proof in that yep so there's a lot of stuff that is the old way that's still functioning in yep. venues which I'm I want to be like honest with people and I want us to have an honest infrastructure with the community with yep. musicians and it's just like if there's a fee there's a reason if there's this there's a reason and there's yes there's cost but the, it's just cost you know but it's also like none of this hidden shit like that's what that's what's part of the decline of the Toronto music scene too. And I know a lot of people who yeah. are heavily involved in like the infrastructure of like, uh, you know, Alma Combo and places like that. And I asked yep. one guy who's the sound guy I work with at the Air Canada Center. I said, what do you think about a lot of these venues like going under, like 
uh, you know, silver dollar and all these places that went under. And he's like, fuck them. He's like, fuck them all because they didn't put a dime into anything for 20 years. It's there, like, there are those legacy venues. And I'm not singling out the silver dollar, but that's just like an example right. that for 20 years, shit's rotting. And it's just like, I understand it costs money to do stuff like that, but it's totally. like, of course it's going to shut down. Yeah. And so it's like, you don't give anything back to the customer. You know what I mean? So the customer is yeah. coming for an experience that like, oh, this is a legendary uh, name, reputation. Like you said, we're coming back to that. So they're coming back that they're still holding on to this reputation, but somebody new is coming and they're like, this place is a fucking dump. And it's like, why should I come here? And there's been, yeah. and I saw this all with, you know, the busy streak I had leading up to the pandemic. And it's like, half these places aren't going to be around after this shit. And yeah. they are not. And yep. it's, there's a reason because it's the whole infrastructure of, of what you consider a music venue was already changing before the lockdown. And yeah. it was already in, in dire situation. It was in dire need of a change already. And the pandemic was just like a reset of it. And now it's like the people who are thinking outside of the box, literally, yep. that are expanding. And it's like... and. What I really love and it's really cool and I've already had this mind, you know, as a rapper, I've always been had the door shut to me because it's like when I book my own shows and I'm like, I'm Alex is a rapper from Toronto and they're like rapper. We have two venues for the rappers over there. It's like the bottle service and that yeah. I don't like the way those shows are run because I right. worked the club scene 20 years ago when I was young yeah. and I know the crookedness of it and like the pay to play format and all that shit i don't like that so i went on my yeah. own booking my own shows and i risk nobody showing up to those shows yeah making no money but i'm not paying you all this money yeah to to do a 15 minute set opening up for a bigger artist so yeah. it's like me i was already kind of like going away from that and i actually when i booked i had to change the word rapper i was just like uh a lyricist yeah so then they make yeah. up their own mind of what it is so then i yeah. started getting booked in rock venues and all these other different places where i just let them look at the music and decide themselves what that genre is so when i put my band together it has jazz elements we're getting booked at, at, at places that are traditional jazz bars now yeah. Too. So it's like they're slowly opening their mind of like what, uh, you know, like their uh, genre is. It's kind of, you know, yep. you know, they're expanding out to that. And also it's like uh, what I really like is like what is a music venue? So now it's like there's opportunities of libraries, cafes, yep. all these different weed shops, all these different types of places that not necessarily you would think how you know house parties stuff that was kind of uh you know has been around for a while but it's also kind of like a new phase now yeah that's what i'm i'm that's what fills me with hope yeah oh, it's exciting musicians sometimes forget that we have this special skill called creativity and we can bring it anywhere we can yeah yeah um we hang out with each other and we see that we all have it yeah and we forget that it's like not everybody has that yeah to like actually come up with something new yeah and and then also to have the courage to say it out loud yeah like, what if we had music right here right here yeah and not every, some people are gonna go that's that's dumb and you have to go no 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 you need that yeah you need that you need the wild animals. and i see that in toronto now there's um my my good buddy peter sellers of sellers and newell it's the cutest little bookstore and they book a couple bands a oh, week. Oh, I went there. I went to talk to that guy. Um, that guy. Some of it, some of them are touring acts. Yeah. And there's it's like a tiny desk. Yeah. Type of. Thing. Yeah. yeah. Surrounded by books. Yeah. And he's making his money during the day with his book sales. Arguably a difficult industry as well. Yeah. And uh, and then at night he's having these concerts. And guess what? People are buying books too at the concerts. That's what you do on set breaks. You go. Ooh. Right. That's the other thing. It's like products that wouldn't normally move with live music, like you said. And before. music that wouldn't probably normally be booked in in a bigger venue. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, this, this existed before the pandemic, but it's a source of inspiration. Uh, Rod Gun and Barber mm. here in Toronto. Uh, they have a couple locations, but the location in the junction books music. Yeah. So I go there during the day. Get people and I get my haircut. My, and... I get my haircut. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, during the day, you can also like have a beer. Yeah. You know, they have, I don't, I don't do the cigar thing, but they have a box of cigars there Options. and it's just kind of like, you know, masculine space, yeah, you know, yeah, fish yeah. on the walls yeah. and guns and stuff. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I don't think they work. Yeah. Um, and then nine o'clock rolls around and right under the moose head, <laughs> literally, you, you set up a solo artist where I've seen a four piece band tucked That's into that corner dope. and there's people sitting in the uh barber chairs getting their getting their buzz getting their music fix yeah. and there's a place in hamilton like here's that. the strength of the that venue because they don't have a ticket sale they do they do the jug thing okay but first off the bartender really hypes up the jug if you're going to expect a band to come out and play for the jug as the owner it is your res- duty your duty. That's a huge shit that to nobody make talks a about. Noise yes. On behalf of the band. Yes. Um, and then one of the strengths that they have is they have turnover. Yeah. People leave, and that's a good thing. Mm. So one of the one of the reasons I promote the music neighborhood concept. One of the reasons I say to music venues, you know, one of the first questions I ask them, "What's the closest music venue to you?" And they go, "Why?" I go, because that's who you should be collaborating with. You know, if, if there's a music venue across the street from you or next door or Not down the street. Not competition, collaboration. Exactly. Yeah. You need to be coordinating yeah. with them. Especially with like show times. Yes. Because you want people to leave your venue. And that might seem counterintuitive. But think about this. You go to see a live show. You know, let's say it's three forty-five minute sets. That's pretty standard. That's what Montreal is you know, all about. You get a table. Gig hopping. You get a table. Yeah. You order a round of drinks. Yeah. Maybe get some appetizers. Then you know, maybe second set. Hey, let's get another round of drinks. But by the time you get to that second round, like I don't know about you, but my friends aren't partying and binge drinking. It's not. It's not as in vogue anymore to to be doing that. No. So by the time you have one or two drinks you have spent your money yeah and that third set who's spending money third set not, not many, many people not many folks they're nursing would, those drinks yeah it would be so much better for them to go well i hear there's something down the street mm-hmm. pack up go there what are they going to do when they first get there get around drinks. they're going to get around round of drinks yeah. and then you clear out the table you clean it off you get a new group of people in there what are they going to do the first thing they do they're going to get around the drinks yeah. so now your music venue has the sales of a venue with a higher capacity than you actually have that's what you're actually doing doubling up on your table yeah, yeah. yeah. you are exceeding your capacity by just spreading it out yeah not all at once um, that should be the ultimate goal for every music venue in this city is for people to leave. Yeah. Uh, and I there's places I see it working. Um, on Tuesday night, if you go to Kensington Market in Toronto, mm-hmm. um, there's going to be two main jams. There's going to be the fam jam at the supermarket. And the fam jam is this continuous jam. They play for like an hour 20 at a time. Yeah. And it's just this funky, continuous animal that that lives people and people are tagging in and out yeah so if i want to go play guitar i go up to the guitar player i go hey man can i have a turn and he goes yeah "Yeah." and he gives me the guitar and it's handed off like that yeah right so very unique jam then down augusta street you go to handlebar yes and there's another jam but it's a bit more open mic yeah and there's a list you know and people get up and play an original song on an acoustic guitar and sometimes they have a band behind them and it's a very different vibe but who goes to these? It's all the same people. Musicians, all the same. Because musicians think, man, I can double dip. I can yeah. go to one neighborhood and get like a couple playing experiences in. Yeah. I can run into a lot of people I know. Yeah. So along Augusta on a Tuesday night, you see nothing but people with guitar cases and saxophone cases walking up and down Augusta, hitting up both spots. Yeah. It works for audiences too. Um, I don't know if you remember Gate 403. Yeah. 
Oh, on uh, Roncesville, right across from the local. Right across from the local. Yeah. And that was the attraction. That's what I used to do. I used to go watch some jazz there, and then you go over there to the local, and yeah, and it didn't even matter if you knew who was playing. No, you just go because you just want to get up and leave. Yeah, get some fresh air. You want to have get a smoke some outside, air. and then, yeah. But that's the thing. It's like you're 100 percent right. It's like even the audience, even the band, the band is like tired of playing three sets, of like you know. If how exciting would it be for the band if they had like a new you know you had like a, an audience for two sets and then you yeah. have a third set who has a new set of audience that's re-energized yeah because they come in and now they're seeing you for the first moment and they're stoked yeah that's happened to me at um what's the jazz one again uh, Emmett Ray yeah so we've been to the Emmett Ray and it's like we've played three sets we're taking a break. Those people have left, and then the third set, a whole new people have come in, and they've been partying somewhere else, and they come in they're like yeah. more vocal, you know. Yeah, it's like it would be so cool. And here's where you tie the social media in together too, right? Yes. And I've been approached by uh, Dr. Keys, uh, met this guy, but his idea basically was, you know, every single uh, venue and and small business has a TV. And they're playing CP24 or whatever. And nobody's paying attention to any of the shit. So that you, could be so many things. So what you do is you have either, either you have, it's everybody, you make a channel yeah. and everybody tunes into that channel. You could have a YouTube channel or something. And what you do is a, a revolving thing of ads yeah. for upcoming shows. Yeah. So you have somebody that feeds that and then that feeds out to all the, the every venue has a link to the site there's a lot there's so many sushi places i've been in that they have youtube on and i speak to the manager and they start playing my music videos yep so there's revenue for us there's that they're advertising for all the, the the music venues and what you have is like you have a calendar you, you like have a community thing that rotates and it's ads you can have ads for you know the local restaurants you could have all this community connectivity and then you yep. can link it and it's a rotating thing on a ch like a YouTube channel that just says like a, a, a hour loop or something. Yep. And you have weekly listings. Here's, Here's another one. All the listings of the and then so the vet, yeah. even the band that comes in from out of town and they're they're on their they're they're having a break at the pizza place next door or sushi and they're like oh fuck there's all these places this week and I can go here and this and that and yeah it's exactly yeah. Um, Here's one. Here's a great one for venues. Wouldn't it be great if every venue had a playlist on Spotify? Mm -hmm. Now we're getting somewhere. That's played at set breaks. Yeah. That features all the people that play there anyway. Yes. You know we got these set breaks. Why not use it to shine a light? And you have a recorded music. Of it. Yeah. Like QR code. Yeah. Exactly. If you yeah. dig this mix, check us out. We're, we got this mix on Spotify. Yeah. I like to see the one thing there's pros and cons of everything. So the, yeah. the, the, the shitty part about Spotify obviously is they pay the lowest. But totally. So fuck them for that shit. But the good shit, they yeah. have great analytics. Yeah. It's a great infrastructure. It's probably the best infrastructure for all the music streaming services. And the, the thing where that could tie into beautifully is also it's like touring artists. Yeah. So it's like I'm going to Montreal and now I'm in their loop of that. So what the cool thing of, of, and when you're gaining fans like that, the cool thing of that, and I don't think it uh, works with it anymore. Uh, Songkick used to work with it, but I don't think Songkick works with Spotify anymore. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing about Spotify is like your fans, it'll show you who's from Montreal, yeah, who's from Ottawa. And when your listing goes out, it's only going to, contact those people in Ottawa when you have a show in Ottawa yes. instead of spamming everybody it's going to be like when you're going to Winnipeg it's yep. like those are your fans of Winnipeg are going to be alerted of your show so yeah. having that infrastructure in place already with a link that everybody can go to it's simplified for business owners to say yeah. yes I can tune into that that's simple enough for me that I can just set it and forget it yeah and yeah. Uh, a lot of places they have visual stuff now that they have no idea what to use with it yeah and uh there's a weed store up the street and he just is, is 
London theme place, but he's got two big screens and he's just got B-roll of London on it. But he's willing to put up stuff that I sent him. Yes. So I gave him those ideas. He's like, yeah, I'll put it up for sure. I'll put your flyer up. You know, I got a digital, uh, you know, JPEG you can take and all that stuff. So it's like the, the, the venues are there to be open-minded. It's just like, you know, I think in 2020 it was kind of all new. Yeah. So now I think the, the understanding of, of, of how easy it can be done is easier to pitch now I think to venues and yeah I mean I think there's al- some there's always going to be the sticks in the mud yeah exactly um, and you know also it's their venue you know they get yeah. to decide how they exactly. you know run things and they get to uh, reap the rewards yeah but um, that's the venues that are doing well uh, Drum to Berna yeah that's a venue that's doing that amazing was, well they, 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 they really uh, hone they switched gears during the pandemic too yeah. because it was like now here's a spot that's low key and think about this they're booking three acts sometimes more a day yeah and that's the Nashville tr- style I be- of like I believe they charge a cover uh, for the late show yeah the early shows are driven by the donation jug yeah and everybody's making money Musicians are going there and playing a gig and making money. Yeah. What do they do differently? They uh, force the spotlight. They force appreciation. Uh, that I forget the owner's name. He's always got a hat and he never skips leg day. Yeah. What's I his think, name? I think I know. Him. <laughs> Keys. Keys always plays there. He's... He will stand on the bar. Yeah. And be isn't this effing awesome? Yeah. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I need you to give money to this band. He makes the noise happen. Yeah. And and there is a, if you've got a pie chart yeah. of the Toronto uh, music scene, the Toronto music scene is a $350 million juggernaut. Dude. There would be a slice that is dedicated to that dude yeah. alone. Yeah. Who gets on the bar and goes, we need to support this. That's and, what I wanted and, to. Uh, and if you're not here to support this, you shouldn't be here. Exactly. That's what I wanted to interject uh, when you were talking about people, uh, venue owners, the responsibility of them to get out with the jug. Because for us, it's very humiliating. Right. It's very humiliating. People don't realize how... Yeah, you don't want to do that. ...humiliating that that is as an artist to walk around with a jug to ask for money to drive home. Yeah. And to eat. That's basically what it is. And it's like... Arms for the poor. Please! Yeah. But... (laughs) It's like when you get that an owner, it is like night and day, and it shows the the uh, the patron, the person paying, watching you, that you're valuable. Yeah, that you're valuable. That this guy's so hyped that you're here that he's gonna get in your face to get some money. That's happened once to me, and it was at Wolf Island. Yeah, and uh, Mikey's awesome. He got up and he's a musician too, right? He gets it. So he gets up and he's like, he guaranteed us 200 bucks. Yeah. So he got up and got around. He basically got us 400 bucks. And he was just like coming around. Aren't these guys awesome? Yeah. Aren't these guys amazing? Yeah, it's a great show. Hyping you up as reassuring the people that what they're seeing is really good stuff. Because a lot of people might see new stuff in a small town and not know how to react. So when I, when I, I, I mentioned I'd approach the junction, uh, BIA, yeah. um, to do a community music project with them. And uh, we were writing a grant together. And um, I'd really strive to set up an ecosystem mm. with that plan. Um, to spend the money setting up a situation where musicians will make money. Mm-hmm. Um, they thought it should be sent to subsidize the payment for the musicians. And that's sort of like the, where the fork in the road happened. Yeah. But... Um, I believe that music ven- it's in a music venue's best interest to have three streams of revenue that go towards the band. Um, if you're going to not just pay them outright, which yeah. is probably the easiest way to do it in the long run. Yeah. Um, it just requires that investment. Yeah. But let's say you don't have that investment. You're a, a new struggling music venue and you're trying to find a way to make it 
uh, work for the musicians and you've made the gig as easy as you can. You made the gig look really cool and be a great place to gather content, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But now you're getting down to the brass tacks. Yeah. How am I going to pay the musicians? Here's the three ways you should pay them. Uh, first, the tip jar can work. That is the main source of income for Nashville, for New Orleans. It is accepted. It is not deemed uh, inappropriate. Um, and the only time it gets awkward is when the audience doesn't know their role. Yeah. And isn't that the truth here in Toronto? Hell yeah. When people start fishing for quarters. Yeah. If you're going out to see music. <coughs> Montreal. <laughs> Sorry, if you're going out to see music yeah. and there's a tip jar there and you didn't pay cover to get in yeah you, you, you should you should feel guilty look at a how little many, guilty look at how many musicians are on stage yeah divide whatever you're about to give by that yeah then look at how many people are in the club multiply by that you know you should be able to figure out that wait a minute if I don't support music here and now nobody's going to Exactly. You need to take it upon yourself. Yeah. How, how dare you? Tell the people. How dare you? <laughs> Someone is on stage yeah. emptying their tanks. They're yeah. giving you their energy. Yeah. It's going to feel good. Yeah. When you put money in a musician tip jar, it does feel good. It feels good for everyone. But then, like you said, there is that responsibility. It does not fall on the musician to take it around. That is oh. a venue job. That's a venue you know? job. It's great when you have a friend who can do it for you. It's great when it's a pretty girl. For some reason, also, people always give more. But here's the thing. with If, if the venue doesn't want to pull out of their pocket, then it's incentive exactly. for them. Give us something else. Give us your effort. Get off your butt. Sorry. All right. So that's, <laughs> like, yeah. that's stream number yeah. one. That's stream number one. Yeah. Um, with the hopes that everybody gives. You know, you should you should be at least giving 10 bucks a person. At least. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah, minimum. Um, that source of revenue will get the band to give quality yes is directly tied to the quality yeah when people are like i can't believe how good this band is that's when the tips go up yep. so you're ensuring quality like a, with that a tip la job. laughter for a comedian totally <laughs> totally totally uh revenue number two a percentage of sales yeah because that should be a given with yeah most and that's not a loss no. you want your musician invested in how much is being sold and 10% at the end of the day is not that much. 15% no. is not that much. No. Um, and I'll say this too. I've seen, seen it before where the venue's packed. The, mu the musicians did their job. They brought a crowd. And the venue still doesn't make money. Sorry, I'll interject there. Sorry. Uh, yeah. What do you think of the in, the in the bill already, like the M and Ray has it? In the bill. So I was going to get to that. Yeah, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Keep Revenue going. stream yeah. number three yeah. is cover. Yeah. So I know there's venues that would rather get people in the door yeah. and I get the logic behind that. But first off, you should always have at least a $6 cover because mm -hmm. then you can register your originals that you're playing so with can. SoCan, you can get SoCan payments. So you're denying musicians a SoCan payment by not charging at least a $6 cover. Yep. Um, secondly, you're weeding out the people that aren't serious about spending money in your establishment. That's Homeless a, people coming in on, like, it's not that they, I mean, they don't deserve to hear live music. And even well-to-do people, you know? Exactly. Just cheap people. Yeah, exactly. You, know? um, yeah. you, you do want to figure out who that is, and you do want to prioritize seats to people that are there to spend money. Exactly. So that if someone goes, oh, a $6 cover that you can add to my bill or that I can pay by card, no, I'm going to pass, that's not a lot. And you, you would have to be foolish. To you're think you're providing entertainment. It's like somebody who doesn't want to pay to come see a movie. Yeah, like, you're providing memories. Yeah, you know, yeah. you want you want you want people that value your venue, mm -hmm. and um, and then with that cover, yeah, the musician is invested. In how many people show up? You're in it together. That's a mm -hmm. good thing. Yeah, you know, um, and here's another thing I will. This is a little bit of a tangent, but we were talking earlier about getting people, uh, taking content in your venue. Yeah. Um, every venue should have a memory spot. Everybody should, let's say that everything went well, people showed up, people spent money, people made memories. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a special night. They want to take a group picture. So where is that going to take a place? Backdrop somewhere. Again, pick your spot. Light it. Light it. Put your hashtags or your accounts that you want tagged. 
a little reminder with the camera. Yeah. And something cool. Uh, this is not a music venue, but this is one of the best examples of this. There's a great place called Oyster Bar here in Toronto. Yep, I know that one. And yep. if you say a special word, they open a wall that is a, a bunch of bottles, and there's a secret speakeasy in the back. Yeah. And they tell people, you can't take any pictures unless you see a horse. And you go, what does that mean? Now, obviously, it's not a real speakeasy, so there's not that actual level secrecy. It's it's part of the experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they go, no pictures. This is this is a speakeasy, right? Yeah. This is illegal. Yeah. 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 And you get into this cool venue, and then in the back, there's this carousel horse. Right? Pulled in the ceiling and the floor with nice, mirrors all nice around. It looks super horse. cool. Yeah. And there's all their accounts for you to tag. It's not that they don't want you to take a picture. It's that we, they want you picture pent up. Yeah. Oh, I haven't taken a picture in like 10 yeah. minutes. Yeah. And then you get someone who loves selfies and taking pictures of their food. And suddenly you get, you've given them permission to take a picture in the spot you picked. It's almost, re it's reverse psychology. It's like, don't take a picture of this thing. Over exactly. Here. Yeah. So yeah. you have set the stage for that picture. And I see it all across Instagram. Uh, when I was single and doing the, like the dating app thing, I would see so many ladies with this horse. Yeah. Yeah. Taking that picture, yeah. Yeah. right? So where is that for your venue? Yeah. Where is that special spot, that iconic spot that you want to trend where people have had a good night and you just give them this little reminder, hey, you guys should take a picture in front of this wall, yep. in front of this mural, in front of this moose head, whatever, yep. whatever your shtick is. No, it's a whole different part to it. And it, it's something that stands out as your venue. Yeah. Like just, oh, everybody knows that I went to, there's uh, a place in uh, Stratford I played, it's actually like a, almost a year ago, it was called uh, Bunker, the Bunker. Oh, okay, yeah. And they have this little area, almost like it's like a movie theater lobby if you come in. So they have a wall, it's kind of like a red carpet thing, and they yeah. have it lit up, they have a backdrop with the bunker. It says, so it's like people come in, get their selfie, they leave, Get yep. their selfie. It's lit, yeah. You know, and it's it's something that's decorated that would you know people would appeal to. So, it's and it's about the experience, and then people wanting to take the experience home with them and sharing it. That's the big thing. And it's yep. like a lot of these places they go and they get an experience, and they're like, oh, I can't share it with anything. It's like I you kind of lose the memory. Or you of it forget quickly, you know. You know. Yeah. Or you you pick a different thing. Yeah. You know, everybody's going to pick a thing to take a picture of or yeah, stand in exactly. front of. But it's all about sort of guiding to the same spot. Over here, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, a gentle coaxing, a gentle yeah. reminder, yeah. you know, can make all the difference. Yeah. can can That can make the difference between viral and not viral. Yeah. Um, here's another uh, word that I would love to see get popularized. I talked about, a bit about this on my Instagram. And for anybody who follows me on Instagram, I apologize for... I, I get on a little ranty sometimes. Hey, I try to be concise. Yeah. I try to be positive and solution focused, but there, I see things and I, I want to talk about them. Yeah. But in regards to tip jars, we discovered something when doing our backyard concerts. We didn't want to charge a cover charge because then we were a business, then we were a venue, then alcohol licensing and insurance and so much other shit. Yeah. So we didn't charge a cover. We first tried tips and we encountered so many of the same problems that, that you encounter in Toronto. People thinking that, oh, here's a toonie. Yeah, yeah. You know. For two, three hours of free music. So yeah. <laughs> we, we thought, we gotta figure this out. So we implemented suggested donation. Mm. Suggested donation. Yeah, let's let me think mm. for Isn't you. Isn't that so friendly? Yeah, it is. Hey, I yeah. got a suggestion for it. Yeah. I would, I'm just gonna suggest that we don't be cheap. Hey, here, yeah. here's an idea. Yeah. So we we set it kind of high. Yeah. Because we were BYOB, bring a picnic. Yeah. We didn't have many revenue streams actually. Yeah. Um, but we said just suggested donations thirty bucks. Yeah. No, that's a good. Suggestion. And we didn't flinch. Yeah. And it wasn't enforced. We just sort of told people, this is kind of the vibe. And most people want to be on board. They just don't know. Yeah. You know, they think that putting money in the tip jar is like when you pass someone busking on the street, you know, 
Not really. That's the confusion. So what did we find? I would say 95% of people gave at least the suggested donation. So now you got people basically paying a $30 ticket. Mm -hmm. But 5% of people gave less. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal, to be honest, though. And that, rare, that might have been all they could give. Rarely you have that one one or two people put a little more in. Actually, little. very common. Yeah. I would say about half of people gave more. Yeah. Now, part of it was due, it was the pandemic and we really communicated to people. The, the whole point of this backyard concert is to help. Yeah. So if you're not here to support, please don't book a ticket. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. that's really we want somebody else You can watch it from home for free. Exactly. Um, but it was about expectation and communication. Yeah. So if you are doing the tip jar thing and there's a friendly doorman at the front that goes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to blank venue tonight. Tonight is uh, the suggested donation is $10. Yeah. Um, it's not enforced. And uh, you can, of course, be more generous. But we want to know that this is a room for people that want to support music. Well, inform and like information is key too. Like to have a good door person who can explain and re and explain the situation. Yeah. Some sometimes it's just like here's a sign, and you get people that work in the door like mm, 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 pointing to the price. Just like, yeah. Mm, that's it. And then a little simple explanation would be, you know. Yeah. And you know we've tried everything. Come on in for free. If you like what you hear, pay. But I find that the suggested donation is the best. It seems to work for us for that situation. Sometimes it's some. Here's the other thing too. You, uh, as you know, as you know, it's like you have to take those decisions into your own hands and negotiate it. Yeah. With each venue, it's like, and a lot of them will try and sway you away from you making any money and just letting people in for free to drink. Yeah. And uh, one example, I went to this place in Windsor with, with Keys and like we were able to watch each other while each other played. And uh, the guy's like, just let people in, you know? And then, uh, you know, I was like, well, are you gonna give us a cut of the, the, the percentage of the, uh, the bar? And he's like, yeah, we can do a 10%. But then I'm thinking, I'm like, well, everybody's not gonna drink a lot of beer or my, my person yeah. might have one beer and then so I was like you know what we're good uh, we're gonna watch we're gonna do the door ourselves yep so when Keys plays I did the door and then I was just like you know what folks we're on the road uh, ten dollars is suggested pay like we're just you know we want to make our gas money and, yeah and, and we have a hotel here just to pay our, our expenses and everybody paid ten bucks yeah no question just bang 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 and they're like seeing live music and the, and the owner was happy uh, you know that we took charge of that in a way but also he was willing to just like not yep. let us get paid you know? and, I, I and that's think, very common I think that the average person wants to uh, get along with the social contract Yeah, they want to you know okay, what's everybody doing while doing this yeah sure 10 bucks you know yeah um and it just takes that little extra communication, little little extra understanding. Yeah. Um, I I worry sometimes that we have these hardworking, optimistic people in our industry yeah. that are hitting the stage and like trying to make a go of it again, and the audience is interpreting as that as oh it's fixed. Yeah. We're back. Yeah. And I I try to remind people like yeah you're gonna see performers with a big smile on their face on stage and that's a very brave person trying again holding back a lot of stuff yeah That's we've not all been, really oh we, yeah we've yeah. all been through it you know? oh yeah we've been through it so all. uh the the music scene uh during the pandemic we lost 96 percent of our income nationally it's a three billion dollar industry crazy yeah. we lost 96 percent of our profits um i went to the canadian country music awards last year i saw jason mccoy at talk. the gala dinner we're gonna get to that and yeah. he uh he accepted his lifetime achievement award and he even said, like, man, middle of the pandemic, I was working for Bell. Yeah. He was like, I was on their phone line. Yeah. Jason McCoy, yeah. you know, it gutted the industry. And we're, we have no hope of coming back with the same thing. We have to make something new. And that's probably for the better. And you know what's cool about, we are talking about the CCMAs. Um, now, what I'm noticing is, you know, there was a surge with the, the industry, like, 
I'm talking about record labels in general. Yeah. They didn't know how to come out of this because uh, it's a whole new change for them. And the, the eyes instantly went to TikTok. And it's like now, okay, this yes. is how we find talent. Yep. And it's very misleading because it's yes, people are very talented on TikTok, but it's the reasons why they're talented. They they might have just done a cover of something, yep. or this or that, yep. and they just got lucky and and it, and it's you know got viral. But what is what I'm seeing is happening is the record labels turning around, looking at artists like us that do it all. Yeah, and they're turning around and like. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. And it's basically like they're looking for artists that have everything complete already. You're already doing everything yourself. And yep. it's like they want to buy in. They're marrying into that. Yeah. And I and so I kind of want to just switch gears with the conversation here. But it's the same thing we're talking about. And it's like the way I look at uh, comedians and podcasts 10 years ago. Yeah. Is what streaming and social media and live streaming is to indie musicians now. Yeah, because ten years ago, maybe even fifteen years ago, you needed uh, just for laughs comedy. You needed a sitcom. You yeah. needed all this to be a successful musician, or uh, sorry, a comedian, and make a living at it. Yeah. Now, the this infrastructure is so strong with their all, all they all have their own podcasts, and it's like one guy gets hot, and then he gets into that circle, or one girl a comedian, yeah. they get into that circle of the podcast. And the, what the podcast has done is grown their their um, audience to uh, live shows. Yeah. So now you have a special. You can put it on YouTube and it goes buck wild and you're selling uh, tickets on the, sh the road. So I think in collaboration with venues and I use that term very loosely venues yeah. um, with indie artists like ourselves, it's going to help. We're going to help each other draw crowds into our shows. And we're not only going to take over, uh, you know, revenue for ourselves, but yeah. it's almost kind of like we're going to dictate how the music scene changes. And I believe down the road, there's not going to be a music label anymore. There's not going to be the label anymore. It's going to be like artists that do it all and they have a team. A team that they, you know, uh, they have, you know, somebody marketing, somebody social media, somebody videographer. They have a, a group of a dozen people. That's 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 basically what the label is in, in an essence. Yeah. So and then, you know, you and I collaborate and then we can help each other on the road. So that's this is the exciting thing that I'm really stoked yeah. about and stuff like this, the, you know, the podcast, all lots of shit like this. And hooking up with each other and social media has really helped us as tools to connect and it's such a big country yeah do you get you know you know uh, geography wise but it's a tiny community people wise so yeah. it's like the degrees of separation so now I'm gonna segue into CCMAs because I work the CCMAs That's oh rad I, I do live production Right on. So I was there the last three years. I Very was there cool. this year. Oh, you're in uh, Edmonton. Edmonton. Right on. How was that? It was great. And I know you have a, a connection with uh, Brett Kessel. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Brett, the last two years, because I'm, I'm the guy who helps the steady cam. I'm like the steady cam's oh, uh, assistant. The robot arm? Yeah. yeah. So, I'm like, I assist him. And we did a couple of, um, you know, segments with Brett. And he's really cool, and we were just chatting. He's a really like, cool guy. But this year, I was waiting for that, and I was going to talk to him about you. But he was performing instead, so I never got the chance of downtime right, right. during rehearsal to chat with him. But I know, just with AV, touring, everybody I meet, there's one degree of separation. Or two degrees yeah. of separation is like, I work with that girl work with that guy I know that guy and everywhere I go yeah I see a musician I know yeah I've worked with and uh, I love it and I think the technology is going to help us 
in the roots that are already there. Yeah. And I think the more stuff we do like this, the more we take control, the more, uh, you know, we bring in people that are good at what they do, writing grants, you know, publishing, all these type of people. We're the ones that are going to be employing people. Right. Like we're going to be getting yeah. the revenue and I'm like, now I can play a, pay a social media person full time. And then what's going to happen yeah. is like the record labels are going to copy us and the venues are going to copy us. So it's the same thing as like yeah. how comedy changed. You're seeing comedy in different types of venues now that you've never seen comedy in before. Yeah. That's going to be the same with music, right? And uh, anyways, yeah, I wanted to say that connection. With yeah. CMAs. I think that was kind of cool. That was cool. That, that was uh, that was 2020. Yeah. And it was like mid pandemic. I started the first one I did was in Calgary three years ago. So I started, okay. Yeah. So a friend of mine, because I've done production for a long time. I've done Juno's like a lot of, I've done this for like 20, 25 years. Yeah. So uh, my friend who came up with me, it's his show now. He's the technical producer. Okay, very cool. So I hadn't done entertainment in like 10 years. What's his name? His name's Cam Martin. Cool, cool. And he's like the technical producer. So I was working a CFL game with him and he's like, do you want to do this again? I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm good. And he goes, well, I'll give you this amount of money. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll do music again. Yeah. But And the sweet thing is, is that I stepped aside, because I did, I work here, I do live sports and I do entertainment. So 10 years ago, I was doing a lot. Like I was doing yeah. 100 hours a week. I was doing all this shit. So I made a decision to stop doing the entertainment stuff and focus 100% on my music. Yeah. So I was like, I'll make way less, but I'll be way happier. And I'm going to do all my music. So 10 years later of me doing music and touring on the, the across Canada, now I'm meeting these people that I have a degree of separation with. So yeah. it's like, really cool like and being on the road and uh being on in production and like oh i know that guy that guy plays with this guy or this person plays with this person and yeah it's it's really nice to see i always hear uh my buddy derek down and we he he'll oh, say derek uh, started me in the in the open mic scene yeah man on axis up on junction he'll always say uh, if you want the world to get smaller join the canadian music industry yeah 100 yeah. percent. it's 100 percent true and it's like it's weird uh, because you know you think you're on your own out there in the on the road. It's yeah. it's tough, especially by yourself when you're out there. Yeah. But the more you get out in the cities, it's like you you great these great relationships, and then you get out there again and again, and it's like yep. this 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 community is getting tighter and tighter, and you you work with AV people, you work with sound people, lighting people, all this stuff, and it's like. People I work with do the biggest shows you can think of. Yeah. But they're coming out of the woodwork to say, can I help you? Because yeah. they fucking love it. Everybody yeah, loves man. music. Everybody loves to be a... I have my, my, one of my best friends. He's a shooter. He's one of the best shooters in Canada. Yeah. He's like, let me shoot some stuff for you. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I'll give you some money. He's like, no, I don't want... Like, I want to help grow and independent music. I want to give my skill to to help grow yeah. the scene you know? and that connectivity um can't be underestimated um you don't have to look very far to find a musician that wants to complain about the music industry and there's stuff worth complaining about absolutely and but, if, there's, if there's things to complain about there's definitely things brewing yeah but i i always like for us to sort of recalibrate and, and realize we're part of this music industry. Yeah. And there's a lot of work that you can start with individually. Mm -hmm. um, because as we interact with the music scene, the music industry is, the music scene is a living thing. And if you're not getting anything out of it, my first question is, what have you put into it? Yes. And how have you affected it? Um, because we have the ability to lift each other up and we're all trying to solve the same problems. Mm -hmm. You would think in a scene as big as Toronto's that there would be more scenes within it. 
if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yep. 100%. And I've, you know, my performing, I do my originals and I also get to collaborate with so many artists. I get hired as a guitar player a lot. And so I've been able to dip my toe, you know, in the blue scene and see the Maple Blue Society and how they function. Yep. I've gotten to spend time in the country scene and see how the Ontario Country Music Association and the Canadian Country Music Association function and the Folk Association. And um, there's so much individualism. There's a lot of people, you see it in the way people talk. Everyone's ready to talk about what they got coming up. Um, And you go to these conferences and you feel like there's no actual talking, communication, networking going on. Yeah. No one's listening. Everyone's ready to talk about what they got coming up. Yeah. Yeah, And I get it. Which is, yeah, it's hard. It's, you gotta get, you have to do it. Totally. Yeah. But, um, so little collaboration. Yeah. So little, uh, teamwork. Um, so much shit talking. Yeah. So much shit talking. Yeah. Yeah. In the States, you know, people, I think are quicker to, Go like that's a good song, man. You know, for whatever things you can and can't do, that's a good song, and you should push that. Yeah. Whereas in Canada, I think maybe partly a scarcity of opportunity. There's more of an element to push people aside, and it's it's because it's Canadian. Yeah. It's under the surface. Yeah, I've seen it all. I've worked yeah. with the biggest bands. I used to do all the ho- um, the house sites for the Air Canada Center, so I speak with. A lot of like the the main um, sound tech for each each touring band. Yeah, and the big 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 American bands are the nicest people. Totally, the nicest. Yeah, and like I don't want to say like just I'm not saying Canadian in particular, but a lot of big Canadian acts, the biggest assholes I've ever met, <laughs> like. And there's some sort of like incubator or ego or something, you know? Yeah. That it, that, and also, I just want to touch on you talking about, you know, a lot of individual uh, promotion. Mm-hmm. And I think, I hope to see, and I'm, the more and more musicians I talk to and artists I talk to, mostly solo artists, the power of like what we have here is so fucking huge. Biggest music work acts with in the each world other coming co- out of Canada to collaborate with each other, and it's like we create this infrastructure. Yeah. And here's a big changing thing too: Canadian content. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I've been going on and on about this stuff about the CRTC needs to update and all this shit. So it's yeah. like Bill C11. Exactly. So also the thing of like, we used to be the forefront of not only providing talent, but production. We did everything here. Yeah. All the cartoons were made in Toronto. That's true. All the fucking uh, kid shows were made here. Yeah. All the music shows, SCTV, branch, all the comedy, music, everything all started Toronto. And it's like it all dried up because all the Canadian content is like chewed up in desk shows where they're talking about other people's talents. And it's like... I grew up on much music where it's like you had somebody who did the music show who was an yeah. expert in music. You had a, somebody who did the fashion show who was an expert in fashion. You had somebody, you know, like a tech uh, wizard guy who was good at tech stuff. And yep. so that needs to come back. It's already here. So yeah. it's like you have like... It's not an issue of there not being talent. Exactly. The talent's here. The talent they is here. They just give the money to the talent. So it's like... And I hear that from players that move to you know more established uh, centers like nashville yeah uh, new york and stuff they'll say like man i was expecting like this like uh next level musicianship but he's like there's there's it's the exact same like there's great players there's middling players there's people who are trying to get better yeah you know it's the same degrees yeah you know there's just it's it's over a different framework and a different ecosystem it's more of a it's it's more of a competitive uh, battlefront than more of a collaboration uh, you know system yeah like there's so many things that could be done and it doesn't have to you know rescorch the earth like you don't have to change everything from new I think a lot can be done with simple solutions I think 100% I yeah. think a few things like you said like you know just 
a strip of venues working together, you know, uh, some sort of infrastructure that advertises for all the venues. Yeah. And also, like, you know, a collaboration amongst uh, venues that are promoters. Yeah. And stuff like that. And giving that part of the job, and I'll call it a job because it is a job. Yeah. A professional, like, um, stage to stand on where it's like, this is a key aspect to bringing people in. Like, I did this place in Edmonton. Yeah. And it was in the middle of fucking nowhere. And it's a great spot. Like, the, the place is huge. The, the stage is amazing. The sound yeah. tech was unbelievable. He mic'd all the drums and everything. It was crazy. But it's hard for people to get to. And it was this lady. She's like, oh, I, I blasted everybody on Facebook. And it's like to, to the point where she annoyed everybody. But it's like there's a perfect example. If they just had some sort of technology infrastructure yeah. in the venue. And also instead of because she's one of the bartenders just doing her own page yeah out of her own page of course she's gonna annoy everybody yeah you need a page that's the the venue's page yeah and you need somebody okay bring in somebody that's younger or something that understands it and just dedicate you don't have to give that person a full-time job it's almost like yeah. five hours a week you come in on monday here's the list of shows we have for the next two weeks yeah and uh, there are venues that are doing that but there's very few and far between like uh, I'll, I'll big up the Kingston music scene. Right on. They have a couple cool little links. They do. I love I, the buckle in Kingston. And the few ones, and they have Kingston listings for the week, and they really push. Yeah. It's really good job they do. And we, we have, um, unfortunately, this is kind of genre specific, uh, but Jazz in Toronto yeah. are doing great work. Or, Ori Dagan. Yeah. Um, and to their credit, they've been so inclusive with music that's definitely not jazz. They are. They've given me a few yeah. shots. Like I've had the Emmett Ray a couple times, and I've had the, the what's the the Ven the on Danforth there. Here's one thing I will say. Like we can accomplish so much from the roles of musicians and venues, yeah, and we can accomplish so much with these simple modifications, mm -hmm. changes in attitude and effort and, you know, how we work a show. Ultimately, eventually, as a society, as a government, we're gonna have to decide this is something we wanna, we wanna invest in again. And there's so many different avenues for that. There've been a, several uh, lump sum payments out to the music industry that have really helped people keep the lights on and keep the fridges full um, and grants, have always played a great role in bringing attention to music that might not otherwise uh, that might otherwise fall to the wayside. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in a landscape where the music industry is failing, the grants are like the main event now. You yeah. Know? So, um, so at, at some point we're gonna need more. Um, if you're a musician listening to this and you want that to happen, here's some things I would say. So first off. Uh, if you're in Toronto, there is a music advisory council. There is a music office. There's people that are uh, assigned to this task. Mm -hmm. um, we should know their names. Yes. We should interact with them. Yeah. Um, we should say, hey, we have something to offer we to you. We should involve them in our, our yeah. experimental venues. Yeah. Yeah. Because... I definitely think it's a case of they're too far from the problem. Yeah, and I, I honestly, I hate to say it, but it's like we've always been the connection. Yeah. And we will be the connection. And then here's the other thing I will say. Musicians and artists. There is already a system set up to improve the music industry. Yeah. And it's called the Musicians Union. Yeah. Um, and this is where sometimes you lose people's attention because it's not an exciting, cool thing. Yeah. Okay. So let me get your attention for anybody who's listening. The Musicians Retirement Fund is one of the most untouched funds for, for retirement. Wow, yeah. And the reason being is so many musicians will join the union temporarily. Yeah. Um, maybe you know their career is only a couple of years and they eventually move on to something else. Yeah. 
or maybe they just do it whenever they need to get their P2 visa to tour the States. That's yep. a very common scenario. Yep. So what ends up happening is money goes in, not everybody collects. Mm. If we want to change things at the government level, if we want more for streaming rights in this country, um, if we want more Canadian content, if we want more tour support, all that good stuff, it would be so much easier if we just had a union who fought for us. Absolutely. And how do unions acquire power? Well, money, membership. So one of the best things that we could do as a uh, music scene, and this can go nationwide, is uh, get involved with your union. Yeah. Um, get a membership. Um, there's so many other benefits that go with that union membership. Uh, as I mentioned, the P2 visas, but also there's great resources um, uh, also, uh, options for things like healthcare and dental and, um, and, but that, I think that's ultimately where this conversation eventually has to head. Mm -hmm. We need to get the word out to the scene. Hey, what if we all rejoin the union and set and, and made it clear to them that we need their, their efforts to fight this battle? Well, I think you nailed it. And I, the biggest thing is is musicians being aware of what they're not aware of. Like there's so, so much, much out there for us. And even, there's tons of resources. Even like we, we, we can, we can open up a whole bunch of uh, avenues and we'll do it on some other episodes, but uh, even publishing alone, like a lot of musicians have no idea about publishing. Yeah. And there's a friend of mine and he, you know, he got featured in uh, some Raptors opening videos. And I was like, are you registered so can with that? And he's like, no. And yeah. I was like, whoa, no. Totally. And I was like, you're missing the window. I'm not thousands of dollars, but you're missing the window on a few hundred bucks maybe. Hey, and like, you never know when it comes to... You never to... know. And if, if it yeah. goes off somewhere... I had a song that I recorded. It might go off somewhere else, you know? Yeah. And it's like that education... And all this other education is, is so key and vital. And totally. Uh, yeah. So you had a... And everybody has different inroads to the industry. Yeah. So we're all working with a de different set of information. But that's exactly why what I mean when I say we're all trying to solve the same problems. Yeah. Um, inside each of us lies the solutions yeah. to those problems. Yeah. And if we can work together and be good to each other and, and lift each other up, there can be a, a great bounty at the end of it for us you know well i had the biggest uh resurgence this summer and it's the, the thing i'm most proud of is this festival i did in the summer oh the i didn't hear about this oh so i uh if you're aware of the q gardens here okay at the beaches they have a gazebo so in 2020 i lived down the street at Reneva, and yeah. i had a like place the third the size of this place and there was no windows. I'm going fucking bananas. I'm doing stuff online, which is the fun. It was the thing I looked forward to the most. Yeah. But I so wanted to just like play outside and play to somebody and see their reaction. Even if they walked away, I wanted somebody's reaction. So yeah. I went down there and there's a power outlets. So I was like, hmm. So I got all my shit. I had the two KRKs, brought all my shit down, set up a little table. Played two hours of my whole catalog straight through two hours of rap music and uh, people were engaging yep. at least there was a few people that hung around people actually just turned around and like actually you know paid attention and it was the most fulfilling uplifting thing and yeah. I was like if I can get the courage to do this then I can do anything that I want to achieve so my mind was like I have to utilize this. So four years later, I finally did. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, with the help of my guitar player, who's very good at um, speaking um, government, <laughs> he's like, this is what you want. Them we to need do. people like that. We need, he's like, this is how you want to say it to them, you know? Um, and there's another thing. If musicians want to come to me and for stuff like that, I've got a, I've got mine out of the ground now. So basically... I got it and I had to do it within a month. So I scrambled and I got it done. Yeah. I, we had insane lineup. 
Like yeah. I had Aaron uh, D'Souza come out. I had Marcus Walker and his band. I had uh, Fifth Project. I had Dr. Keys and his band. And my band had two sets. I had EM Lord out. We had seven acts. We yep. crushed it. Yeah. I got local sponsors. I didn't get all my money covered, but I got sponsors. So the neighborhood saw it. It's on the books yeah. in the city. I did it. And it's like, I'm not going to change anything drastic. I'm just going to improve on that and do it again next year. And that, to me, is like the biggest achievement I've had with music. And it's yeah. like, now I got my my uh, community that I used to have before the lockdown back on track. Yeah. Yep. And stronger than ever. And more resources than ever yeah ever before the uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because COVID-19 was the second time that Toronto was wiped out by a pandemic 2003 the tr- yeah the I Toronto remember. music scene yeah um, we had SARS the, number one the SARS scare yeah. um, and for anybody old enough to remember that that's me 45 dog we were saved by the Rolling Stones yeah they and said Justin Timberlake. Yeah. Give Timberlake some the, credit, man. He fucking He slayed it. He slayed it and um, people look at the tapes. This kid was the biggest fucking music artist on the planet yeah. at the time. And he came on his own dollar and people yeah. booed him. And he was, dodged bottles. And he dodged bottles and he fucking stood up like a professional and he fucking played music and he didn't complain. Yeah. He didn't say one fucking thing. And he brought his talent. To help Toronto. So yeah. If anybody knocks Justin Timberlake, go fuck yourself. It's like... <laughs> but you look at that. Yeah. You you go, we've been here before. We did this. And what do we have to show for it in a sense of preparation? You know, the second pandemic comes along and, you know, we can't rely on the Rolling Stones every time this happens. No. So when are we going to learn a lesson? And this, I think the, the city needs a protocol. Mm -hmm. that they can implement it's in their best interest you've got all these people that live off of music do you which would you rather do would you rather cover them with serb or would you rather enable them because as i'll say it over and over again musicians are one of the hardest working groups of people in the world the pace the endurance it takes to make it in a big city playing music is most people can't do it the multiple facets of talent that just equal up yeah. to one performance. So here's my idea. This is how you enable musicians in a pandemic or another like emergency like that where it's like we got to shut down society. Yeah. You know? How do we prevent people from like starving to death yeah. in in the arts? Um there are stages all over this city just like the one you were talking about. Gazebos, park stages, um, I think of the Cedar. Have you seen the Cedarvale stage? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just gonna. That you, stage you is finish this and I got something to um, say. There's the one uh, off of uh, Church Street in there's that, a, in that there's park. A list. Is that St. James Park? I have a list from the Toronto Arts Council. Yeah. All the ones that have the infrastructure. And the the typical regulations, everybody is allowed to reserve a stage once per year. Yeah. Uh, for free. Yeah. You may have to pay for the opening of the electrical box. You have you to, may pay, have to the pay for the insurance, insurance, which, which is, is very cheap. low. It's, it's like twelve bucks. No, seventy dollars for oh, an okay. event for the day. But in comparison to an actual insurance company, it's so much smaller. And you basically get to have your event and sort noise, of approved. Noise permit. You can't event. charge for tickets, but you can have sponsors. Yep. So, the next time this happens, I envision a situation where uh, these stages are allotted mm-hmm. to the music scene. Yeah. And we say, I'm sorry, people, these are emergency times. Uh, these are only going to be used to support the music scene yep. uh, for the duration of this emergency. You uh, identify key leaders in the music scene that can manage Represent the stage. Yep. So that can include uh, a venue owner. That can include a tech. Uh, uh, a tech. Um, that could include a festival. Yep. You know, we could say like, hey, um, you know, Toronto Jazz Fest you run the jazz stage and somebody you know? <laughs> that's part of well somebody i also think that the city needs to be understanding and involved of what the music industry is yeah because the parks and rec departments are a huge department in that yeah. component as well as that too because when i went to the parks and rec one here for the beaches they are so enthusiastic they yeah. want to help so much 
but they're just not sure how to help or where to help. So if you had somebody who knows music that works for the Parks and Rec. That knows how to put together a, a lineup, right? Because obviously these are special skills. I've seen it before. Well, they also, people think, oh, anyone can do well, this. Well, they also have a criteria you know? list too. Like, yeah. Do you have this list? Then we can move forward. And then, you know, there'd probably, an el- probably be an element of noise. Yeah. Uh, so saying, okay, from, from these time periods, we grant that you can make yeah. uh, above the 70 decibels that yeah. is typically allowed. Um, and then as far as how do we make money? Well, during a pandemic, you know, if the main event for like entertainment is outdoor uh, all across the city at these concerts, the sponsors will show up. On well, also to you allocate money for Canadian content. That That's too. Canadian content. It's yeah. by law. But here's the you thing: have to require thirty five percent of Canadian content. Hundred percent. So make that part of that percentage. Totally. Yeah. But here, here's totally my uh, my philosophy with musicians. Musicians only need to be enabled. Yes. Yeah. We, if you say to us, you can play there every day and make music, we'll find a way to make money with it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like that'll happen. Yeah, we don't need the handout. Yeah, um, in instances of like seeding the scene, that's a bit different. Yeah, you know, um, obviously there is a shortage of good paying work in this scene, so I'm not trying to minimize that. Yeah, but what I am saying is we're talking about creative, hardworking uh, individuals who who are used to taking nothing and making something. Yeah, you know, so if you give us a, an empty stage, literally, that's and what say we do. do whatever <laughs> yeah. you want. Yeah. You're allowed to make noise, you know, go for it. The music scene will keep itself going. Yeah. And and we will find a way to make it work. But in those times, there is no outlet. I agree. There's a list of things we can't do and zero suggestions on what we should do in the meantime. Well, we're the ones that are bringing the suggestions. That's the thing. Totally. And there's all these entities that, that are just laying dormant, you know? Yeah. And what I understood because I went for funding for my thing but it was far too late but I was geared by somebody in the Toronto Arts Council and she was phenomenal like really and just what I was explaining to her about what I did she's like this is exactly what we're looking for yeah this is what we want to give the money towards so what I learned quickly is that I had my mind set on this gazebo but what I didn't understand is that they have a list of ones with infrastructure. So yeah. they want you to go to those ones because, A, the infrastructure is already there and it makes it yep. easier. So I was, I, I didn't get that one because I didn't realize the importance of just choose the one that has the infrastructure already. Yeah. So it's like there's a lot of entities, there's things that are there already. And it's just like we have to make the connections. And unfortunately... It's still going to be us. It's going to be up to us. Totally. The artists. But we're not afraid of that. The more we work together and talk together, the better it's going to become. And the better it's going to help facilitate each other. And I think it's going to be very uh, flourishing coming further down the road because, you know, it's like, oh, I know how to do this. I have a friend who does this. I have a friend who's good with this. And it's like, it's all connected. And, It'll all be, you know, a good um, nucleus that we can all grow from. And uh, I think you summed it up right there. Bro. I think we should sum it up here. We've uh, we've had the literally <laughs> long. This is the longest uh, podcast we had. Well, that's definitely my fault. No, that's <laughs> my fault too. It's a good thing. Uh, the only other one that was this long is when Doctor Keys and I had the year in review. Well, and that's when we had like forty shows <laughs> each talking about all the crazy shit well I, I want to say to anybody listening uh, if you do happen to connect with me or you happen to run this meeting in Toronto uh, let's talk music let's talk the, talk the Toronto music scene yeah let's make this 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 our thing you know let's let's make it our thing and I think it's going to be our thing I think it's going to be it's like I said it's going to grow the way that uh, comedians grew with podcasting and I think that yeah the infrastructure the we're, we can't run away from the live streaming. It's some. It's something here to stay. Yeah. And to work with it, with social media to help us all together, grow, grow. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, man. It's a pleasure. You too. And uh, what's what's next on the agenda for you? You got some shows coming up, and you I'm got going into album mode. 
I'm going into hibernation mode. I'm, I'm halfway practice. in there. Yeah. So I wake up, I practice, I go exercise, and then I come home and learn songs. I love it. Love it. I'm in that mode too. I'm in album making mode and I forgot how important it was to do the road to make content. Uh, so, you know, it was like doing shows and coming home with those experiences. Yeah, man. That's, that's the essence of it. So, and that's, thanks buddy. Thanks man. All right. All right, dude. Have a good night folks. Cheers.